But why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why 35 years ago, fly the Atlantic? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept. One we are unwilling to postpone and one we intend to win. We choose to go to the moon. All right, hello everyone. Uh, welcome back to Super Happy Dragon Lucky. This is episode 0x4b. It's the 76th episode. Um, this week, so a couple of updates, uh, number go up. Uh, this week on number go up, uh, we're talking about the monthly number of dragon net nodes. And we had said some increases, some decreases uh, throughout the month um, daily, but last month number go up. And this month number go up. So um, the current total change is 1134. I think that's over, I think we just passed 1,000 of few few weeks ago maybe um i can't remember what day that was and um you know we have some some people making graphics out there and everything's very nice so one way or another uh we really do want to increase the number of nodes because it does uh decentralize the uh level two through level four uh even before we get to to the level five bitcoin and ethereum and uh, those are the fast ones that is uh you can get uh, uh, for a business, really fast decentralization of your proof um, within seconds. And then, you know, you wait for a little while longer to get the hash power applied with uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum. So really neat stuff. Um, the, the other update, um, a DIN, a, uh, a sh very small DIN update. There's so much going on behind the scenes, but we're kind of holding off talking about a lot of it until uh, it's actually deployed. But um, right now there is... Uh, what we call the LCP happening, which is the layer creation process, which is the community side of creating layers uh, inside of DIN. And it's really exciting because uh, <clears throat> coming this month, we expect to have the very first real, at least in my opinion, the real LCP, which uh, is lore based voting. Um, so, it, you know, we've up to this date, we've done everything with energy based voting because it was the scarcity that we had at hand. And it was uh, a very interesting, uh, I guess, set of tests. And they've all really worked well because uh, once we once we launched all of the uh, uh, tokens, lots and, and lore, um, now the actual uh, holders uh, of lot are the owners of these layers and it's a really interesting process. So go in there, check it out, uh, make a proposal, check the others first, of course, please, all, please read uh, as many of the other proposals as you can, because there have been some similar ones and people uh, have then you know, gathered together. So they're more likely to win uh, if they're working together on it. And uh, voting should begin sometime this month. Uh, it will be, uh, we're going to actually have an active discussion before we do it, but we assume it'll be at least a few days, could be a week worth of voting. So um, get in there, ask questions, figure out uh, uh, how it works and, you know, maybe watch it even and, and see uh, see what you might be interested in, in getting ownership of, because uh, there are a lot of really good proposals already. Um, timing and rules, all to be announced. So that's, that's most of the DIN update. We have a couple other things like we have uh, the actual full site-wide uh, governance coming up as well. That should be pretty soon. Um, the devs are getting really close to being able to put that out. And uh, there's a lot, there's a lot more obviously uh, coming. So uh, matter boosting, matter boosting is coming as well. That'll probably be a few weeks out at least. So anyway, uh, right after this short video, we're going to uh, have our guests on the other side.
All right, welcome our guests. We have today Helder Antunes. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Hopefully, it's all right. Close well, enough. Antunes. <laughs> Thank you, John. Antunes. Okay, uh, Antunes. Okay, sorry, I should have done that. Um, no uh, C CEO of Cyvolve. Uh, Helder joined Cyvolve from Cisco Systems, where he held various leadership roles over a 20 year career there. Um, and he also co founded and chaired the Open Fog Consortium. Welcome, Helder. Um, and then uh, John Galinsky, CTO and co founder of Cyvolve. John has over 30 years of senior IT management experience, including CIO for nearly 13 years. And John's muted. Sorry, John. Um, no, go ahead. Okay. Um, do you guys know uh, Nigel was on? Nigel Walker, is he coming back or we you know, lost he's, he's having uh, he's having connectivity issues. So that's what I thought. I've had may have been interrupted. Had so many things this uh, this past two weeks where uh, all the systems nothing's nothing's very uh, clean. It, it things are dropping off all the time. So okay, if, well if he joins us, we'll just roll him in. It'll be all good. So um, and if, in intro. Uh, in, in case he does join us, he's the co-founder and, and uh, chief development officer for Cyball. So, okay. So uh, you guys want to uh, introduce yourselves, you know, give us a little more info about, about uh, your background and what you're about. Sure. I'll start Joe again. Thank you for the uh, invitation and the opportunity to, uh, to chat with you. Uh, so Halder Antunes, longtime Silicon Valley um, started out my career in the mid eighties in a little company called Grid Systems. We in essence made the first laptops as you know, when you look at the form factor of what a laptop is today, prior to that, some of the uh, older guys like me will remember the uh, compact Lunchables, you know, the big yes. lunch boxes. Yes. Um, yep, yep. <laughs> After that went on to, to join a couple of very interesting companies. One was a company called Sourcen. Um, so again, preceding Excel and and uh, and Microsoft project management, uh, CA Super Calc, and CA Super Project. <laughs> so we were eventually bought out by computer associates. Then went on to um, probably one of the funnest companies I've ever worked in, a company called NetManage. It was an Israeli company based in Cupertino, right across from Apple. Uh, we were the first to, in essence, put TCP/IP connectivity in Windows for work groups and provide networking. Uh, beyond what was available, beyond what then became standard with Windows 95 and above. And had a suite of products, including browsers, mail clients, mm -hmm. TFTP, Gopher. So it was a very, very innovative company. Uh, shortly after that, and this is back to uh, 1998, I joined Cisco, uh, was tasked with building a team that would embed network security protocols into Cisco's uh, iOS, into Cisco's uh, routers and switches at the time. So did that for about nine years, uh, and then that opened up the door to, uh, to do a lot of very interesting things inside of Cisco, including connected car um, and what evolved into what is uh, the Internet of Things. Uh, spent the last four years in corporate development, so in essence running uh, innovation and running a lot of the Skunk Works projects, which is how I was exposed to blockchain. Um, and that's also where the uh, idea to form the Open Fog Consortium came about to pull the industry together to, to look at how edge computing in relation to, to the cloud. So if you look at fog computing, it's in essence the same elements of cloud, but closer to the edge where you now need the processing and, and all the other associated uh, uh, items. Um, and this is when I met uh, Nigel and, and John and uh, fell in love with the team, fell in love with the approach towards cybersecurity, which was somewhat fresh, new, and different than, than what I was used to, and decided to, to join these guys and embark on what has been a, a very interesting uh, journey, and, and it's just begun. And so very excited again to be here, and, and that's kind of my background at the 30,000-foot level, 30 years plus. <laughs> that's a great. That's great. That's a good summary. Hey, John. Sure. So my background, uh, I started in the late 80s with uh, all Department of Defense Engineering. My background is really electrical engineering. Um, but uh, it was at the time a brand new concept called digital or computer engineering. They were just forming those ca those categories back then. I ended up working uh, on providing and building a number of sonar systems, radar systems, electrical harnesses for jets, etc. 
And that kind of set my career onto the path of, of security and data security from pretty much the inception, because as you can imagine, everything was fairly highly confidential working for the government. Uh, ended up working for a number of organizations in the Northeast, um, Cablevision out on Long Island, uh, where we set up their first uh, client server architecture. Actually worked with um, 3Com Networking, which most people don't realize 3Com Networking was bought by Microsoft and became the foundation for that. And uh, from there went over to um, Snapple, which you know was probably the most fun company I've ever been at. Worked, uh, I actually shared an office with Wendy, the Snapple lady at the time, um, and had a lot of fun doing that. Uh, we sold that company over to Quaker Oats. Uh, oh. And uh, I decided to stay in the Northeast and worked at that point with Reuters, which is what got me into more of the finance area. Um, from Reuters, I ended up working in London for about three, three and a half years for a foreign exchange firm where we actually uh, created a, a whole new platform, very similar to what Google is using today with the ability to zoom in on graphs and charts. Uh, but at the time, it was a brand new approach. Um, and that's actually where I met Nigel Walker, my co-founding partner. So we've known each other for about 23 years now. And um, post that foreign exchange uh, opportunity, I actually came back to New York City and worked for a company where I was their CIO. And uh, we did all things Bloomberg. So we handled a lot of the accounting work for Bloomberg. So a lot of these concepts for data security have really developed over the course of, of accidentally a, a career path that, that kind of just occurred on its own organically. And uh, as a result, data security and finance have always been the two driving factors in my career. That's great. Yeah, the variety of, of background, because that's, that's the same with me. The variety of background tends to, to help see uh, a bitter, bigger picture and different ways to do things. It's, it's, it's good, really good stuff. Um, so when I ask these questions, feel free if uh, if if the other person should should be the the proper person you know to say oh maybe maybe uh, maybe John you know should answer that maybe help so just let me know right I'll, we have them down but um so first up uh, Helder how how is Cyvolve you know uh, especially because you came from Cisco and you you mentioned a different approach you know how how is it different from from other security solutions and uh, um, and models you know what what they're doing very good. So one quote I like to uh, to use a lot is Einstein's definition of insanity, right? Which is, uh, we, you know, human nature. We try to do the same thing over and over again and yet expect a different result. I tend to look at cybersecurity in that, in that light. Um, in essence, if you look at what most people do today, it's in essence what we were doing 10, 15, 20 years ago. It is improved in the sense that it has more horsepower, more capability. There are more protocols layered on top of each other, but it's really sort of a, a kludged up, an evolution of an approach that has grown over time. Mm -hmm. um, and so where Cyvolve comes in is it's an entirely different approach. Perhaps the simplest way to describe it, and I'll dive a little bit more into the technologies, uh, but one way I like to explain to non-technical people is if you look at most functional stacks are built with functionality in mind and then security is an afterthought. Yes. What these guys did is they took the reverse approach. They built a secure stack. So basically we're, we're securing data at the kernel level. So there's nothing below. And then you can, in essence, add any functionality on top of that, which makes for a system that's inherently much more secure than anything else you build in the traditional way. Um, what makes up this approach is a combination of technology. So, of course, it's encryption. And to that extent, we're using standard encryption. And then it's a proprietary key management system that allows you to um, authenticate in a way that, uh, quite frankly, doesn't exist in the market today. Uh, it's tied into an AI algorithm that models behavioral activity. So all of that feeds back into that uh, authentication model and also creates uh, reporting. So you're able to, in most cases, when you look at how breaches occur, it's not necessarily that the technology gets broken. The encryption isn't necessarily broken. More often than not, it's a breach from the inside where the information is free and readily available. 
or it's a combination of people's credentials are stolen or devices are stolen and people are able to then access that data. So from the perspective that this approach secures data and the data is always encrypted, so it's always secure, whether it's at rest, in transit or in use. So it makes for a very secure system that to a certain extent, it's secure even outside of your domain. Um, so it's a combination of these technologies and again, the approach to securing data that makes this a bit different and to a certain extent more comprehensive than what's out there. And certainly, John, feel free to add on if I haven't done justice to the great technology that you, Nigel, and the team have built. But that's kind of it in the in a nutshell. No, you've, you've definitely nailed it. I will add a, a couple of points that I think would be near and dear to Dragon Chain's heart. The entire concept of Cyvolve was really decentralized security. Um, the biggest problem with security in the marketplace today is that it's still predicated on the domain model. Now, sure, people talk about cloud and everything else, but cloud is really a marketing term for somebody else's network. Technologically, the underpinnings of all of this are still domain-based networking. In the same way that you guys have decentralized uh, the use of blockchain and, and cryptocurrency, we actually allow the security to travel with the data and the owner's security remains with that data. So as a result, it's now a decentralized security model that has a very interesting side effect, which is it now divorces security from dependence on the infrastructure, which means now the infrastructure itself becomes a commodity. And now you start to get towards really this concept of decentralized infrastructure globally. Just wanted to add that in there. Oh, that's, yeah, that's really nice. Okay. It, 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 it's and it's you know when we started talking, it, we'll probably get more into that later. That there were so many things that matched up so well philosophically and uh, technically that I mean it was just a good partnership to to uh, to go down. Um, John, where do you see the future of cy cybersecurity, and uh, you know where is where's the entire uh, market heading? Well, actually, it, it continues along that decentralized vein. I mean, really, what we're starting to see in the marketplace, especially now with the rapid development of connected cars and IoT, um, you're starting to really come up into areas where people are struggling with this concept of a, how do we connect all of this stuff? How do we maintain security and consistency? Um, Gartner actually refers to security as, as requiring a monolithic platform. And that's the second problem with data security out there today is that not only is it decentralized, but there's so many products, there's 72 categories of cybersecurity products alone. And inside of each category, there's dozens if not hundreds of solutions. Right. So the ability to create a consistent experience and a consistent user experience is, is a problem. So really we see the future as moving towards this concept of a virtualized data center. I'll give you one quick analogy. A hundred years ago, every town and state and city were running their own power plants and their own phone switches. And these things were highly decentralized. You had to have local infrastructure and Ford factory and Ford, Henry Ford himself had his own power plant in his backyard. Um, and obviously over time that became centralized and scalable. And you ended up with utilities. You ended up with a nationwide phone grid and a nationwide power grid. That has not happened with data centers. The reason that hasn't happened is because there's been no way to really secure the data at the data level. In short, whoever owns the infrastructure owns the data. Mm -hmm. Now you end up with situations where companies need to maintain their own infrastructure. Solutions such as Dragon Chain and, and Cyvolve and even Cloudface actually now start to create a monolithic platform independent of the infrastructure where now users can start to put their data in security. Uh, securely. So we really see the future evolving into a very quick adoption of a decentralized infrastructure, which is no different than the utility. That's great. Okay. Very good. Very good. Um, Helder, yeah. after the recent FireEye and solar, solar winds hacks, are you finding uh, clients more focused on supply chain security, security in general? Um, yeah, uh, absolutely. I would say even prior to these uh, publicized hacks, that discussion was already uh, at the forefront of most customers, uh, especially in certain verticals, right? If you look at, again, anything IoT related, anything that the, involves mission critical systems, uh, where the integrity of these over the air updates uh, has to be absolutely bulletproof, um, that discussion was already sort of at the forefront. Um, certainly with the, you know, the publicity around uh, the current hacks, I think it has definitely accelerated. It has injected a sense of urgency 
uh, in, into these discussions. But having said that, in parallel to that, sort of the COVID situation and people now working at home and, and, and sort of the IT departments being overwhelmed with other challenges of all this distribution of resources, um, I would say things probably are not progressing as rapidly as we would like them to from oh, yeah. that perspective. Oh, yeah. um, but at least the awareness, the level of awareness, I would say is that it's probably its highest level. But now it becomes the question of how do we go about execution and how do we work with IT departments to, to look at you know, budget allocation to make these systems as bulletproof as possible and address some of these key issues. So there are still challenges, but absolutely at the forefront of the discussion. Right, yeah, this is, a, everything is very different. I can imagine for, a, you know, especially large enterprise IT, how, how much uh, is involved in how things are done right now. And, you know, who knows how long and, Everything else. Um, so, and I don't, I don't know which of you to best ask this. Um, uh, uh, what are some of the unknown ramifications of a data breach that people don't think about? I'll take a shot at it, and maybe John can add to it. I think you know most people, as you uh, in general hear about data breaches, you know you think about um, privacy concerns, you, you know intrusion into people's private data. You think about monetization related issues with these malfeasant attacks you know for instance ransomware as an example but i think most people probably aren't um, as in tune with what the possibilities exist beyond the obvious and what i mean by that is as we live in a world where everything is interconnected and there's this dependency of technology for all things internet of things processes people devices um, I think people probably aren't quite aware of the ramifications of these intrusions from an extent that when you're dealing with mission critical systems, so take uh, connected cars and transportation as an example, right? The ability to hack these systems and spoof uh, data that's being transmitted between vehicles, data that's being transmitted between vehicles and infrastructure um, and spoof location speed as an example, I mean, the potential for, 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 for catastrophe here is just infinite. And you hear a lot of this in the context of AI, right? You know, Elon Musk, whom we all love dearly, um, you know, talks a lot about, you know, AI and the, the machines going haywire. But I actually think the issue is more, it will continue to be <laughs> human malfeasance of injecting, um, you know, malware and in essence, um, you know, mucking with these mission critical systems. Uh, yeah. and, and of course, when you're dealing with systems that have the capacity to inflict harm and even death upon the populace, I think that's probably the number one thing that keeps most, most of us up at night. Right, right. And that's, you know, that's an interesting take too, because uh, a lot of what we build into our systems, especially from the, from the beginning, um, is very much you know it's definitely at its basis is proof and decentralizing proof so that anybody can transparently for themselves prove that this is the same data as it was you know a year ago or whatever but we did find at, at disney that um using the incentives are uh, possible with it by you know either tokenization or, or some other financial aspect really changed the picture because you could you could disincentivize bad act actors and incentivize, you know, um, you know, following a process, which you know can really help with security. Because a lot, a lot of security is about making sure everybody on the inside isn't, you know, being lazy, making sure everything is at least as good as it can be, as far as we can possibly know. Um, so that's interesting. That's really interesting. You know, AI versus market and everything else. Okay, so. Um, John and and or Helder, how, whoever's the best to answer this, um, what was it about the Dragon Chain architecture that made you want to collaborate or at least began the discussion? Sure. So that you know you hit the nail on the head earlier. Um, basically, your philosophies and uh, the approach to your blockchain and GDPR compliance 
proof or trust. The government actually refers to this as trusting the data. There's data security and then there's data trust, which is how do you know that somebody hasn't injected false data? Right. Your approach is identical to our approach. And yet what's intriguing is from a completely different technological perspective. So the combination of the two pretty much covers 85 to 90 percent of the data world. I mean, it's really quite amazing the breadth and depth that we have, and, and yet the consistency across those technologies is, is just amazing to me. And what it shows, and I forget the term for it, there's a term for uh, parallel evolution of concepts. But uh, basically, there's a reason why these things are evolving, and it's because if you step outside of the infrastructure, it, it really is the logical approach. This is really what it takes to get to yeah. that next level. Yeah, I, I agree. That, that was really what, for me, um, resonated when we first first started talking to you guys because uh, it seems like everything everything matches you know usually there's there's some things where we have to explain why we're doing something you know um but with you guys it, it all just made sense so that's awesome um and then uh next uh what value do you see uh in a dragon chain cloud face and cyborg alliance um uh to bring it particularly to your customers right most importantly but but even you know inside of your infrastructure and or um you know known areas that uh that uh you know we can either go after different projects or going at going after them in a different way you know what what do you see as uh the you know the biggest value in that whole mix well i think it, it really is a combination of everything we've just discussed for example um companies and we know several i'm sure you do as well are all looking for complete solutions. People are tired of buying point solutions or partial solutions and having to manage the integration of everything. And then the biggest problem with cybersecurity is that the chinks in the armor are between those systems, the transition of data from one system to another. Yes. This concept of putting together three significant products that service a wide array of, of solutions. And, and this is where we can potentially get into a philosophical debate with various companies, but as an engineer, Joe, I'm sure you understand that mechanically, what we're talking about is identical for everybody. The difference is, is in the nuances, it's in the nomenclature, it's in the, in the verbiage around how this is explained, the user interfaces. But the underlying infrastructure is really identical. Now, you know, 15 years ago when cloud first came out, everybody thought, oh, this is it. This is centralized IT. We're going to all be able to get rid of our data centers. And of course, it was a little bit optimistic because it was only part of the solution. Um, you know, everybody now, has bandwidth, or a lot of people have bandwidth, not everybody yet, but a lot of people have much greater bandwidth down to their home level. Um, the ability to actually provide this monolithic solution where you can now create data and actually become, for all intents and purposes, a data exchange, one that deals with blockchain, one that deals with cybersecurity, one that deals with various integrations. Um, you've mentioned supply chain management. That one is fascinating to us because that hit us sometime in the middle of, of 2020. And it seems like supply chain users around the world have all of a sudden all universally woken up to the fact that there is a problem with supply chain and they need a more secure solution. Everybody's running their own supply chain solution right now. Sure, there are products that people buy and integrate, but nobody ever integrates the product the same in two different ways. So this combination of, of Cloudface, Dragon Chain, and Cyvolve really provides a more of a full bodied solution. So a client can come into this and now you can consolidate across multiple vendors and multiple distributors uh, and really create for all intents and purposes, a highly secure, highly organized exchange for supply chain management or for healthcare or for finance. Right, right. Data integrity, all that. I mean, you know, the funny thing, um, you know, I'm an engineer, right? I'm, I'm a developer and I would always uh, veer into other areas just to, as as a software developer to to learn you know you know how do you set up a proper dns system how do you set up you know firewalls all, all the things that you would do and those are much younger of course but but i i found that a lot of what we were seeing um and this started at disney but really accelerated when when we got out of disney that it tended to be uh it tended tended to be that we were fitting uh, almost as glue code, right? Where, you know, in, a, in a, an enterprise environment, you have some guy typically that's either writing corn shell, bash shell, or pearl sometimes even as glue code. So I have all these systems and, you know, the boss says, we need, we need this data. And, you know, it's on these three systems. How do we pull it together without, without a huge manual process thrown in a spreadsheet and, you know, 
and and doing things that an accountant would do that they you know uh, most of those engineers will script something to automate it so here's a, a you know a brilliant report that we can generate uh, you know later uh, the same type of thing would turn into web pages, but it's, it, uh, it was all, all about pulling data together or moving data around, like you say, uh, as an exchange. And the issue, though, was, like you said, that those were the chinks that and they relied mostly on, on the obscurity that ours is different than everybody else's. So it's going to be hard to hit unless somebody knows about it. Right. Or unless, you know, it's an inside job, that type of thing. But it tended to be something that you know we wanted to focus a lot on because that seemed to be um something that had a lot of weaknesses in the way it was being built out right now and you know with blockchain the fact that you can know that this is the data that transferred between this system and that system that you know when it goes through that smart contract or when it sits on a ledger at any time uh, you can go back and look and say, well, wait, why did this go wrong? And you, then you can actually drill down without any issues uh, of knowing that this the data quality is there. You're knowing, first of all, that there were no um, uh, there were no technical issues where you know we had a drive go bad or something. So it was literally just bad data. So that's why it failed. Versus somebody somebody who actually um, uh, how do I say somebody on the inside that changed something right for some nefarious reason potentially um sometimes even not for a, a nefarious reason but for some reason that just broke things um and and that tends to be really at least for me very interesting because um you you how do i say this once that that information's uh, uh the proof is decentralized you can you can look back at your uh, your data, whether it's for a restore of a backup or whether it's because there was an issue and you can know this really is the data. And if I need to prove it to my customer, I can show them the data, the raw data. Um, but I can also show them here's the proof. You know, we, we know that this is actually the data that came from your uh, from your uh, device or system. Right. Um, it's an interesting thing. So um, I have. Uh, OK, we have we have Kurt's review. How do you tech? How do you keep big tech from controlling you? Do you guys have any angle on the issues of infrastructure? And the fact, uh, as we, as as John described earlier, cloud is nothing more than someone else's infrastructure, right? So if you're putting everything on Amazon, or you're putting everything on Google, or you're putting everything on Azure, there are risks. Uh, generally, in in the West, we haven't seen that as okay. This shouldn't be too much of a risk for my business, right? But if you potentially cross the line, whether it's politically, socially, or who knows what, that you really don't control that. So what do you guys think about that? How can that be solved? That's a great question. I think part of it is the technological approach that we have towards securing data sort of mitigates a little bit that issue to the extent that, as John mentioned earlier, the infrastructure tends to be commoditized. It's really irrelevant. You own the data, you tag it, where you store it. it. Could be multiple places. It could be local. It could be a variety of different clouds. Um, so to that extent, there is a certain level of mitigation towards big tech controlling you. Um, but of course, this is a much deeper issue. And uh, as we're seeing today <laughs> with all the political issues and whatnot, uh, you know, the recent situation with uh, uh, Parler and, and AWS having shut them down, as an example. Mm -hmm. um, th there are levels of this aspect that are beyond the technology, right? They're, they're, they're around policy, they're around right. uh, a variety of other issues. Um, but again, if, you, if we build, and I, I always like to look at everything from a technological perspective, right? If we look at the problems we're facing today, a lot of people like to think of uh, ways of solving these problems or mitigating these problems with policy and best behavior and whatnot. But it's really most of these problems are exist because of technology that evolved to do certain aspects of functions that initially wasn't designed to do so or technology that was poorly developed in some cases. And so I still think that, that the solution lies in building better technology and building technology that then builds these mechanisms to, to, to safeguard some, some of these very issues. Um, so to that extent, and I'll share an example, I, I, I was invited to speak at Davos a couple of years ago 
and most of the discussion was around policy, was around mandating top-down how people should do things differently and mandating different privacy laws. And again, these things all work hand in hand. Uh, but at the end of the day, it really comes down to we have to take different approaches. And so to the extent that a small company like ours and the market as a whole, I think, will will follow and, and move towards a more data-centric uh you know, approach towards security, you will see that some of these issues like big tech control and, and some of these other issues around this will become less emphasized or to a certain extent, less of an issue. But having said that, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a tough question to, to really put forward an, an exact recipe for how you solve all of this. Yes, yes. Now, I think a lot of people um, <clears throat> don't, think about that and uh we you know i even in the past i i uh, uh tried to uh create a startup that focused on that but it was um around 2012 right and nobody nobody cared about it nobody nobody it, it, it they couldn't even consider why would you you know we're just trying to get into cloud why would you want to to uh go multi-cloud and uh yeah that was that was the reason but it was just not the right time so um that's interesting, uh, and I do agree. I think with, whether it's identity or you know any raw data, that the more uh, the more data centric your security, the more uh, likely you won't have to worry about those issues. I mean, because you can move that data wherever you want, and you have the quality proof, and you you know you you can uh, have a lot more flexibility. So that's brilliant. Um, okay, so uh, what what are Cyvolve's uh, ambitions for this year? You know, 2021, big year, lots, go, lots, uh, there's, a, there's going to be a lot happening this year. So what are you guys thinking? Well, we're really looking for um, a number of key areas. It's what's interesting and Heller touched on it earlier. What's interesting is that the whole work from home requirement has dramatically accelerated the evolution of IT probably five or six years. Mm -hmm. um, most of the companies that have reached out to us recently have do not have work from home infrastructure. They can't support it. Mm -hmm. uh, or if they do have it, it's tiny compared to what they now need. It was never built as, to basically mirror the entire network. Mm -hmm. So really a, a lot of what we're providing is in response to the marketplace. And, and again, there has been, we, we've been dealing through, through some of our partners, we've been dealing with very well-known banks. You would know the names immediately that have basically said that they've got mandates to move their systems to the cloud, quote unquote, but they don't even know where to begin. And they've got metrics and they've got milestones and uh, a number of organizations are really looking to cut costs and to divest themselves of the security risk. Um, because the problem is, is that security risks keep escalating. You had mentioned earlier about uh, some of the hidden ramifications of data security. Well, some of those include Cyber insurance, cyber insurance costs have been doubling every year since 2016. Um, companies are now dropping, cyber insurance providers are now dropping companies from their policies. We're familiar with a number of organizations that are now looking for insurance costs and those insurance costs are hitting cost of doing business. So as a result, organizations are, are thinking about how best to divest themselves of that data. So really where we see this moving is again into this concept of a virtualized data center and, and into decentralized data storage. Now, to answer, to, to tie that to your previous question, you know, one of the ways that we secure data that was very important to us, and in fact, it's one of the core reasons we started this company, Joe, is really that the data should belong to the data owner. Hmm. Right now, it does not. The data belongs to whoever runs the network. Hmm. Um, our entire system is designed that the data owner has full control of that data wherever it goes. It doesn't matter. They can share the ownership, they can give the ownership away, but it's a decision process. It's not an abdication of data security. Um, yeah. And that is very different from most organizations because let's face it, most organizations provide cloud services because they want the ability to mine that data. It's written into their user agreements. Um, by really focusing on, on making this a win-win where yes, it's a service, obviously there's a business in providing this, but our entire mandate is to really protect the client's privacy. We cannot get access to the data. It's, it's, we won't get into it now because it's, it's a very complicated explanation, but we are mathematically provably enable, unable to get to the client's data. 
And not only that, but once that client puts their data into our system, they get the benefit of that because now they can store their data in AWS or Azure or any other mm -hmm. cloud provider. And those infrastructure owners can't get to their data anymore. The concept, again, is remarkably similar to blockchain. It's a way of mm -hmm. decentralizing security. And it's a way of giving ultimate data control back to the owners. So right. we really see for 2021, absolutely, everybody's coming back to the table. People are starting to wake up to these concepts. And it's across multiple industries. So, you know, occasionally it'll be supply chain management or it'll be finance or it'll be healthcare. But the bigger industries, including finance and banking, are now waking up to this. We really see a lot of growth in those areas for ourselves this year. Yeah. Are there anything I left out? No, no. That's, uh, yeah, I think you, you nailed it spot on. How long has uh, Stivolve been, been in business? We actually started uh, back in 2015. Uh, okay. We spent four years building the, the software. Yeah, no, because this is very, very, the timing is amazing, right? I mean, that's that's such a powerful thing uh, that you just described for, for right now. That's that's why, you know. Um, okay, uh, next up I have, tell us your favorite quote, right? I know Helder's already given one, so I hope it, I hope I didn't, but it was on the script, so I'm hoping you, I'm not, you didn't already uh, give that quote. <laughs> well, unfortunately I did, and, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll it's okay, Joe, uh, because um, I'll, 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 so I'll share why I really like that quote, right? Um, you know, human beings, we're, we're creatures of habit. And so we tend to think that if we just do what we're doing and find for ways to improve those processes mm -hmm. and, and, and refine them and, and make them better and button them up, somehow we'll get a different uh, output or a different uh, yeah. result. And so to that extent, I, I just, I've always, as far as I can think back, I've always adored Einstein's quote. Yeah. Um, but, but, you know, ha having said that, and this goes back to what we touched on a little bit earlier, um, the quote is relevant from the perspective that this is why we all need to challenge ourselves to think out of the box, to look for what is the problem and what's the best solution. Mm -hmm. versus a little bit of what we have today, which is an evolution of how we deal with these same problems the same way. And to a certain degree, especially those of us who have been in this for quite some time, um, you know, leave a little bit of that technology religion outside the door and just say, look, let's start with a clean sheet of paper. Let's define the problem and say, gee, if you're starting from scratch, how would you solve these problems? And that's why I really like that quote, because I think it challenges people to really think of okay. you know, ways to go beyond the obvious. Yeah. Well, it seems like a little bit of uh, application of scientific method inside of IT, right? Because a lot of times right. nobody, nobody measures stuff. They, they do, they put stuff in place, but they don't actually look, did that work? You know, and can we, can we try something else, see if it works better, that type of thing? Um, you know, they, they do it in some ways, but it seems like it's less uh, 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 like the methodology is not necessarily uh, consistent. Right. So that's yeah. a good thing. But to, Cor to, yeah, correct. And if you look at it, a lot of it is is an evolution of what's been done before. Right. Right. So, right. So, it, you know, this is not to minimize the challenges and the fantastic work that's done on a daily basis, right? Because these are very complex systems with dozens and dozens of protocols layered on top of each other and embedded and somewhat kludged up together. And so we forget that, you know, on your day to day and the challenges of keeping the network and the application and the data safe, you're sort of evolving and going with the time. So to your point, Joe, Sometimes we don't have the luxury to do that analysis right. and to say, ha, could I have yeah, done this uh, differently, right? So, yeah. so it's, it, it's challenging. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of data and not enough time always, which, which is, by the way, um, laziness. And, you know, it, it's, it's, <laughs> that, that's probably the biggest uh, factor, with, you know, and it's because, you know, it's, it's hard work and there's always other work to do. So, um it usually kind of, it usually bites people, but um, that's yeah. why, you know, you have to make things as simple as possible. It's clean as possible. It, it's really cool stuff. I, I, I like talking to you guys. So, um, so, okay. So uh, how can, uh, how can our audience uh, follow Cyval, follow you guys, you know, where, where should they look for more information? 
Uh, so, you know, www.sivolve.com is always a good uh, start. Also keep an eye out for our postings on LinkedIn. And of course, any information, um, either myself, John or Nigel. So Helder at Sivolve.com, John at Sivolve.com and Nigel at Sivolve.com. We're very active. You know, we're still small enough that we, you know, we'd like to engage with customers uh, direct and people who send in inquiries. Um, so a combination of all those resources. But, uh, you know, our, our website is still work in progress. It does have a, a wealth of resources there and hopefully we'll continue to improve it. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. So that's everything. That wasn't too long. Hopefully it wasn't too long for you guys. Um, Fantastic. Uh, it was 46 minutes. That's pretty good for us. Um, okay. And uh, everybody, um, Follow Real Denizens, Dragon Chain Gang, and Jojo Row on uh, Twitter and ever, most most other places. It's the same IDs. Um, check out Din.Social. Go there. You know, follow what's going on. I think most of our announcements are, are repeated on Twitter, but they're going to be sourced on Din. And uh, watch Super Happy Super Happy Dragon Lucky again next week, same time on Tuesday. You know, like, comment, subscribe, all the things you're supposed to do. On whichever platform you're watching uh, we, we did turn off facebook so sorry there's no more facebook uh um we just had too many too many issues keeping keeping the uh the uh scammers out of the chats i mean it was just frustrating so anyway thanks a bunch uh and uh we'll see you next week thanks guys thank you, thank you. thank you very much